Hello, I'm going to um, show you now uh, something about uh, exponential decay um, and that's where um, you have um, you have a formula where uh, a half is raised to an exponent and the exponent would be the number of half-lives of that phenomenon but of course you could also do it this way m sub zero would be your mass initially at time zero and we're multiplying by um, 2 to the power negative n. So you can do it this way too. So the textbook can treat it from the textbook you can actually treat that formula both ways you will get the same results both times. So the idea is we're just basically building a spreadsheet and uh, let's just get rid of all this. So we're build, building a spreadsheet and let's get rid of all this as well. And um, really we have half-lives and the number of half-lives we could probably put in a second column. So we can just drag this column over. Um, so number of half-lives, which is n according to the textbook, right? So the number of half-lives is n and uh, we can compute n here. And of course then we raise one half to that power n in order to uh, find out what the f what the current um, what the current um, what, what do you call it um, the current mass is of a, a radioisotope. So I guess the whole point of half-lives is, I mean, it's used in a lot of things. It's used in uh, measuring radioactivity. That's the, probably the, the one that's it's most famous for. Uh, if you're basically, if you have a radioactive substance, then it's actually your, the mass of that substance depletes with time because basically, usually that's due to unstable nuclei and giving off particles spontaneously. And it gives it off enough at regular enough times that it actually uh, can be mapped onto an exponential equation and that exponential equation actually ends up having a negative exponent if the base is greater than one and of course you could also have a positive exponent if the base is less than one either way you're going to have a decrease uh, a decrease in the amount of mass so let's say you have 5,000 kilograms of or even 1,000. Let's say you have 1,000 kilograms or 1,000 grams of a sample of, say, carbon-14, which is radioactive. After it's, after it's reached its half-life, then it's gone down to half of that. So we go from 1,000 down to 500. And then in the next half-life, same unit of time later, it, the amount of carbon-14 left is down to half of that amount. So it's kind of, uh, kind of interesting how that works. Um, okay, so let's see if we can set up a spreadsheet uh, re with regards to these half-lives. And uh, first of all, we need to know the number of half-lives. We also need to know the time frame that we're measuring. So if we're increasing by 1,000 every time, notice that this Google spreadsheet can kind of figure out um, what should go in the next entry, and we're going to go to 20,000 years. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. So how many half-lives is 1,000? Well, we divide 1,000 by the number of years in a half-life, which is 5,730, and we get this number. So that's the number of half-lives in 1,000 years. Now, I'm going to make sure that E2, cell E2 is fixed because there is only one value. The other, A3, can be relative because notice what happens when I update the cell. I get this many half-lives, and that's because I'm using 2,000 and dividing by 5730. And if you can see here, I'm still using E2, and I got A4 over here. All right. So if we go down, notice that these half-lives will increase, and by the time we get to 20,000 years, carbon-14 would have undergone three half-lives. 
So after one half-life, the mass is down to half. After two half-lives, the mass is down to half of that half. Matter of fact, why don't we, why don't we instead of measuring time right now, measure the number of half-lives from zero? So maybe at the beginning we have zero half-lives, and then we have at in um, in the uh, first bout of decay we have one half-life past, and then two, and then three and we can go up to 20. Well, that might actually be too much, but you know what, we'll, we'll go down to 10. Go down to 10. Uh, it doesn't look like I can move up on this thing. How about if we just start over again? Oops. How about if we try this again? One, two, three, and then pull this box down. Um, and I wanted to go to 10. Okay. 9, 10. All right. I wanted to go to 10 here, 10 half lives. So that means I have uh, this number, 5,000. And I'm going to make sure that that's a fixed cell reference. And I'm going to multiply that by 1 half to the power of well, the number of half-lives. So if I do that, I in fact get half of 5,000. Let's, let's trace this. So 1 half to the power of 1, the value of this cell is 1, although it's covered by this silly question mark here. But um, it's actually 1 half to the power of 1. 1 half to the power of 1 is 1 half. Uh, and then this dollar sign C, dollar sign 2 represents this cell, which is outlined in yellow, same color as this font. It's actually 5,000, 5,000 times 1 half to the power 1, which is 5,000 to the half, which is 2,500. If we do this again, we get half of 2,500. That means that we have three, uh, two, uh, two half lives. And so 1 half is raised to the power of 2, which is a quarter. And then a quarter of, uh, of 5,000 is 1,250. We could keep going. And these numbers will get very small very quickly. So now, by the time we run 10 half-lives, we're down to less than 5 grams of what used to be 5,000 grams or 5 kilograms. Now, if we ran these numbers all the way to 20, let's see what happens. And uh, let's see what happens to this formula. All the way to 20, we're down to 4.7 thousandths of what used to be there. So that's like just under five milligrams, not just five grams, but five milligrams or five one thousandths of a gram. And so this is where we're going with this. So if we have, um, if we have um, this here, let's take a look. Let's, in, well, you know what? Let's, um, we, we could actually look at what the graph looks like by going to insert and then chart. And then you can see here, this is actually what the chart looks like. But again, we don't have a timeline, which is idiotic. But that's, um, that's actually, for some reason, what uh, Google Sheets is doing. I'm not sure why. I'd like to see a curve here. But uh, the thing is, you, when you use Excel, Excel does this a little better. It, you can regress to a curve in Excel. Um, but what you lose is the labeling. The labeling in Excel has to be done manually, whereas here you can see the labeling is automatic and quite intuitive. Okay, so we have here um, mass versus number of half-lives. And so by the time we get, notice by the time we even pass five half-lives, that number is getting pretty low. But notice that these numbers that are almost zero are zero relative to 1,000, because uh, that's like the first tick on the y-axis. So these numbers look very small, but if we go to like the sixth data point, it's actually 78, which is still, you know, that's, you know, something that's tangible to, you know, and visible, highly visible. Even half a gram is, so this number after 13 half-lives is just over half a gram, and that's all the way over here, and notice it's hugging the x-axis. These numbers which appear to be close to zero are just that. They're close to zero. They're not zero. 
Exponential functions, and especially exponential decay functions, never cross the x-axis if the base is positive and if the coefficient it's multiplied by is positive. So in this case, we have um, a number with a coefficient of 5,000 and a base of 1 half. Both of those numbers are positive, and that kind of guarantees, seals the fate of this function of never going negative. It'll never be a negative uh, and what I mean, and what that implies, is that in order to become negative and remain a continuous function, obviously at some point it would have had to have crossed the x-axis, but this function never does. And so because it doesn't cross the x-axis, it never goes negative. So that's, uh, that's some of the features of exponential functions. Uh, we had... Um, we had examples of exponential decay also described on pages 162 and 163 of your textbook. I'm just taking a different sort of example. Now I know in uh, chemistry and in physics there's a slightly different formula and this formula is really almost the same as this formula, this formula here, except we deal, you see the number of half-lives is computed separately. It's computed as t over you know, the time elapsed divided by the time for one half-life. Now the time of one half-life is one um, continuous, you know, sorry, it's, it's one unit of time. In this case it's 5,000, I think, 730, 5,730 years. So the number of years that that sample has been sitting there divided by 5,730 would be the number of half-lives and that exponent goes there. Well, the only thing that's different between that and the one your science teacher taught you is that that calculation is actually done inside the exponent anyway. So this t over th actually is n. This is n, right? It's actually just placed in the exponent. So m of t, uh, I think your book uses a of t, but who cares? m of t, m for mass, right? Mass at time t, okay? Mass at time t. That's kind of what I'm going for here. Uh, although a a would be what amount amount at time t and that's a pretty common common letter to use too. Well, the mass at time t equals the initial mass mass at time zero. You can say m of zero too, um, you know. Um, and then it's equal to one half to the power of the number of half lives, t over th, which was described over here. So I, I kind of emphasize here that th, we, you know, when you say the word half-life, it doesn't occur to someone that that's an actual fixed unit of time. 5,730 years is a fixed unit of time. It doesn't change. There's nothing magical about that number. It's just a unit of time that spans an arbitrary number of years. And it's different for every substance. Uranium-238, uranium-239, these have different half-lives. Oxygen, um, you know, radioactive oxygen also has a different half-life. Uh, tritium has a different half-life. These are all, um, and, uh, you know, uh, radioactive tritium is often used in um, tracers um, medically. So then uh, you have basically, okay, so you have time and years. T, T, T alone, T without any subscripts, is just the time that has elapsed, the time that's passed in years. It's, it's really what should have gone under here. So now we're going to do this a little differently. We're going to compute the half-lives differently, and we're going to compute the amounts differently. We're still going to start from, we're going to get rid of this too. We're going to start from 5,000 grams, but the time in years is going to go up in increments of 1,000, and then the number of half-lives gets to be something that's not quite straightforward. It's not just one, two, three, four, five. Oh dear. It's not just one, two, three, four, five, uh, and whatever. It uh, is what I showed you at first. So uh, the number of half-lives really is this number, 1,000, divided by um, 5,730. So this time we're going to really look at the mass of carbon-14 after 20,000 years. So you can see the number of half-lives is only a fraction at 1,000 years. It's close to 0.2, but not quite. And then as we go down, 
down to 20,000 years. Oh, we got a division by zero. That's not very nice. Okay, let's see what's, we'll see what's going on. We have this, we have, oh, A3. A3 over E2. I forgot to fix E2 as an absolute cell reference. So let's do dollar sign E, dollar sign 2. And that fixes E2 as an absolute cell reference. And we can then compute the rest of the numbers. I just went over that square and double clicked on it. That's how I got that. And you can see here, it, this is 3,000 divided by 5,730. This is 8,000 divided by 5,730 and so on. So these are actual numbers of half-lives, except here in these cases, these numbers that are just nice multiples of 1,000 are not really nicely divisible by the actual half-life of radioactive carbon. So now when we um, apply the formula that we're, that we're talking about, that the book is talking about over here, this is what the situation looks like. So we get 5,000, which is a fixed cell, and it's multiplied by uh, 1 half, 0 0.5, to the power of, um, oh, to the power of n. There you go, done. So 0 0.5 to the power of n, the number of half-lives. And we should get a number that's slightly less than 5,000. It shouldn't be very different from 5,000 because this is only a fraction of a half-life. And so it's no surprise that we're still not out of the 4,000s yet. And so if we go up to the next unit, up to 2,000 years, or 0.35 roughly half-lives, we get 0.3925, um, uh, 0.531, uh, 53, yeah, 531, uh, grams. So now we're gone just a shade below four kilograms. And as we go on for 20,000 years, you can see that the number of grams uh, of radioactive carbon left in the sample is still quite substantial. It's almost half a kilogram. Um, if we actually went to a thousand Notice those numbers would go way, way down, but they're not. So 5,730, you know, we can see that's sort of the numbers we have. So if we now um, take the time and take the mass, I don't know if I can actually make a graph of that. Let's just do that. Oh, nice. So we got a chart, which is just a scatter plot. And you can see here that the scatter plot gives you a uh, exponential decay curve and notice it's just a curve and it gradually goes to the x-axis. If this was more like one kilogram that would change all the numbers. The starting conditions always change everything and so you can see it's still roughly the same but now what has changed is the scale of the y-axis but the shape of the graph remarkably is the same. So if, let's go back to 5,000 well, what would change the shape of the graph? Well, changing the half-life would. So if we now go to 1,000 again, this is what our graph looks like with a half-life of 1,000 years. It's, it crashes really quickly. And uh, the numbers go to under half a milligram by the end. So we're, we're actually you know, going from 5,000, we're decaying by a factor of 1 million and it's going all the way all the way down to below five milligrams. Five, five milligrams, a milligram is one one thousandth of a gram, all the way from 5,000. So it's a, you know, that's a huge amount of decay, but it's still not zero. Okay, that's the thing, it's still not zero. So let's change that back to 5,000, or 5,730. Okay, let's change it back to the way it was. And so this mass versus time, we know the we know the formula now. If we if we write the formula, the formula on the bottom of the screen here is m of n. Or let's use the textbook convention. So a of n is equal to 
the starting the, the starting mass, 5,000, multiplied by, um, well, what do we do for brackets? We have to go up here, and then we click on here, 1 half to the power of n. That's really, that's really the formula that is responsible for generating all these numbers. Now, you might want to, there's a little bit extra to ha be had here. Um, you might be curious, for example, uh, about the ratio between this number and this number. And in fact, any number and its neighbor above it, right? Any number and its neighbor above it has an actual reliable common ratio. In fact, um, if we say take this number and divide it by this number, we actually get this 0.8661 number. Well, okay, if we do that again with this number divided by the number just above it, it's crazy, eh? It's like you get the same thing. Let's go to some random part of the distribution. How about if we take this number and divide by that number? Isn't that crazy? Every number, every basically every number above can be multiplied by this number to get this number, which is another way of thinking about this formula. But that's something to be covered. This, this makes it a geometric sequence, which is not covered till near the end of the course, but you can see it's not a big deal, <laughs> this idea of geometric sequence, but eh, we'll just leave that for now. So that's, that's to be covered near the end of the course. You can see that that's the kind of thing that you can look at. And notice that we do get a graph. Um, too bad I cannot hook this up with a continuous curve. Um, I don't know about um, chart style. Mm, charts, chart area. Okay, how about chart style? I really don't know. Um, Chart style, okay, chart and axis titles. I don't think there's a way I can hook these up. Um, point shape, point size, error bars, data line, ah, trend line, thank you. Ah, there we go. Look how lousy this trend line is, it's terrible. Oh God, look, it's a straight line and almost none of the points fit on it. But that's because the type of trend line is linear. Okay then, let's just make it exponential, which is what we wanted. And there we go, bang on, isn't it? Just bang on. Now the label, eh, we'll use the equation. So here's the equation. Oh, oh boy. Yeah, you know, I shouldn't show you equations that are generated by spreadsheets because that kind of scares people. If I, if I do that, what, what the heck is that? So we have what, 5,000. Oh, hold on a second. Let's go back into the equation editor here. here. That's equal to 5,000 times, look at this thing. Look, look at here. See that? I don't know if you can sort of squint close to the screen, but there's an E in front of it, a letter E. <laughs> what the heck is E? Like, okay, you know what? Here, how about if we do equal sign EXP1. This is E, this is the value of E, 2.71828. It's a, you know, in some fields of mathematics, such as calculus, it's a, it's a number with magical properties. Let's just put it that way. It's called the natural base, okay? And it's upon which we build the concept of the natural logarithm, Never mind, but that's one of those things. So let's go over to, um, let's go over to here. So this is E to the power of what the heck is the rest of it? 1.21, oh, negative 1.21 e to the neg negative 04. Well, this big E is different from this big E. This negative 1.21 to the po power of negative four, that is how the spreadsheet shows you scientific notation. Well, you know, in uh, at Microsoft Word, we don't have to put up with that nonsense. We can just do the scientific notation here. Negative 1.21 times 
10 to the power of negative 4. And there we go, scientific notation. But it's e to that exponent, right? That's an exponent, that's a power of e. And that, but then what, so what about this number? Where's the, where's the n? Where does n fit in? Oh, it says x. It's using x. So obviously it doesn't have to use my convention. So we're multiplying by n here. n goes there. So how about this? Times, times n. In fact, I'll put this in brackets just to separate this so that it's easier to read. And then, okay, there we go. So e to the blah, 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 blah. Um, don't worry about this. But I have a little secret to tell you. I mean, some of you are probably worried sick that what if this is not the right formula? What if this is the right formula? I know, you're worried sick. I have to tell you something. They're both right. <laughs> They're both right. You can actually, you have the ability, not you don't have the ability, you might have the ability, we all have the ability. In mathematics, we have the ability to express any exponential function in terms of any base. So here we have base 2, 2 to the power of minus 1. It's 1 half. So that's a base 2 number. Well, this is a base E number. E was that 2.71 jobby, right? That 2.71 number. So that's, that's why we see two different expressions, but these will actually uh, result in identical numbers. But 1.21 is a little bit, a little bit strange. Uh, I'm not sure where the 1.21 comes from. It might be the logarithm of, it might be the logarithm of uh, some number. It's not 10, it's not two, not sure what it is or even the natural log of 2 or the natural log of 10. It's not any of those numbers. It looks like kind of a strange number. But that's what they came up with. And if you go over here, um, oh, hold on. If you go over here to the spreadsheet, could we, could we generate an identical, um, an identical uh, column of numbers using the formula that was in the spreadsheet? Well, you can. So you go equal sign 5,000, and then you go that multiplied by. Um, this time it's you're gonna have to put this in brackets because you got a minus sign 1.21. This might not work out. I, I just for me I get the feeling that the 1.21 is an irrational number with a non-repeating decimal that goes on forever, and I think this is just rounded which means that I'm not going to get a real, it's all, all of my estimations are going to be close. They're not going to be bang on. But um, times 10 to the minus 4. How about if I just express it as 0 0.0001. There you go, 10 to the minus 4. Times, oh, hold on. I forgot the e part. Now, in um, basically, you can see exp is a special function in a spreadsheet where it actually takes the number in the bracket and raises it to a power. It raises it to the power of what I have in the bracket. But we still have to multiply that power uh, by uh, the number of years. So we got to use this. And what do we get? There we go. You see, within a rounding error, they're the same number. Now, I don't know. Because it's an exponential function, it's possible that the rounding error will just get worse and worse and worse with continued calculations. And let's just see if it does. It might get really lousy. Well, it's surprisingly still good. It's off by 0.2 of a gram, or close to 0.3 of a gram. It's actually pr still pretty good. So this... This formula, which is the rounded version of this formula, is is actually there, as, as I as I've, you know, am able to prove to you, both formulas work out quite well. They're both equivalent. So now, um, there's a couple of other things to um, 
to get out of the way. On pages 164 to 165, you're going to have um, you're going to have uh, some examples with laws of exponents and negative exponents because, as you can see, it becomes a factor, uh, especially in the demonstration I just gave you. Um, and I gave you a video last week on laws of exponents. You might want to review that if uh, you're if you feel a little rusty on it. Um, then there is um, okay. And then also, you know, fractional bases. Like, you know, if you have basically, I think the lesson is if, if a number is less than one and it's raised to an exponent, uh, if it's raised to an exponent greater than zero, that, that function will increase. It will keep increasing. If the, fract, if the base of the, of the exponential expression is a number less than one, then as an, as the number of half-lives increase, uh, that number will go down. So you have increasing if the base is greater than one, decreasing if the base is less than one. Um, and uh, for practice, I'm asking you to do uh, exercises one through seven and uh, eight, nine, 11, and 12. I hope you guys are doing okay uh, stuck at home uh, during, the, um, during the crisis. And um, I'm, we're doing the best I can. I owe you one more lesson. I think I'm a lesson behind. And 3.3 um, is on rational exponents, which isn't really a big deal because we've covered the basic idea of rational exponents in the video on exponential laws that I discussed last week.